Welcome back to Learn at Lunchtime. We're so glad everybody could join us today. A um, couple of logistic things that we're going to be covering at first. Um, we're going to be using the question and answer option at the bottom of the screen. Now, the question and period will be at the end of the program. But if you have any questions that you want us to address, uh, particularly at the end, put that in at any time and we'll get to them towards the end of the program. Um, I'm going to put a few things in the chat box along the way as well as policies and issues and things like that. But one of the great things I'm going to be putting in the chat box is a link to the fact that we are open again. The State Museum reopened today, as a matter of fact. So we're very, very excited. And this includes um, all of the PHMC Trails of History sites as well. So welcome back. We're super excited. Um, and hopefully maybe the next time we see you guys, we'll be actually in the building. So that link will tell you, because there are some different things about hours and other things. Um, we are going to require masks and social distancing while you're in the building. So look at those. But today we're going to be uh, discussing quite of an interesting cat. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to our program director, Bradley Smith, who is going to start this program off. Thank you, Sherry. Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. As Sherry mentioned, I'm Bradley Smith. I'm the program director at the State Museum of Pennsylvania. And this program is called Treasures from the Vault. It's a program of our Learn at Lunchtime series during which we explore unique specimens and artifacts from our collections at the State Museum. Today, I'm joined by our senior curator of zoology and botany, Dr. Walter Mashaka. And we'll be discussing a taxidermied mountain lion from our collection, which is allegedly the last fully documented specimen from Pennsylvania. Walter, thank you for joining us today. Pleasure, Brad. Walter, could you tell us a little bit about mountain lions and what uh, role they play uh, ecologically? Certainly. You picked a, a really good topic, Brad. I'm uh, glad to be doing this with you. The mountain lion at one point ranged throughout North America. It's a top predator. Think of it as you would a uh, blade sharpener. It kept the herds of, of ungulates sharp and fit. Think of it maybe even as a lawnmower, just keeping everything in sort of the balance that was typical, normal for that community. It's a superb uh, ungulate predator, uh, deer and elk and the like. Tell us a bit about uh, the different subspecies of mountain lions. Well, that's that's has a story unto itself. We, we get to cover a, a good bit of uh, topics here to synthesize it. The cougar all has comes by several names: catamount, puma, panther, and the like, which reflects that it had a broad geographic range with people living in their own areas, knowing the cat as they did. Well, from a scientific standpoint as well, many regionally distinct forms were recognized. Uh, those would be subspecies. And as you can see, there's quite a list that covered uh, North America. Now, at one point, uh, they broke it down to where there was the Florida panther, which I, uh, those of us watching this today are probably familiar with in the news. Then there was the Eastern Cougar, as you can see up in the Northeast, it's the darker shaded area. And then there was also what was called the Wisconsin Puma, uh, Shorgarai. But that was up until recently. But you know, science moves on, it's a process. That's what science is. And now having done more analyses, they've, they've uh, broken it down for all of North America is having two, the Florida Panther, and then the North American Cougar, which subsumes all of those other forms that we just saw in that other uh, slide. Now, as science moves, it's because there's new technologies, there's new ways of uh, studying things, new mathematical models. So for example, when you saw that, that a high number of subspecies, that was based on a tried and true approach of uh, skull morphology. It had its biases for sure, and it may have masked a few differences and it may have amplified differences that weren't really there. 
but in more recent times they've used DNA and DNA likewise can be incredibly useful if you're using the proper genes to answer the right questions. But with, with, a, with a confluence of different approaches, particularly with this DNA analysis, we're down to those two, two uh, subspecies. And I'll just add that this photograph shows researchers from Penn State University taking DNA samples from uh, the actual mountain lion specimen from our collection. Sure did. They, they absolutely sure did. And, um, and that gives you all the more a reason to look at a specimen as a first edition book in a gigantic research library. So the more specimens you have, this is why in biology we tend to get series of things, the less variation you have to account for, the more accurate you can be, which gets us to the issue of this one remaining uh, specimen, well, one of a few remaining specimens. Walter, you mentioned the differences from region to region. Could you talk a little bit about how widespread mountain lions were historically? and what their distribution is today? Well, as you can see from, from this, this wonderful map, you know, cougars, panthers, pumas, just that group is, was uh, really a, a, a widespread animal in North and Central America into South America, no less. It's a, it's a big group. And uh, a lot of science was conducted in North America. So that's why you saw lots of different subspecies initially identified and they went all the way up into Canada. This is quite a, 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 an ecologically versatile animal that can make it down to Florida, into Texas, and all the way up into uh, to Canada. But it got uh, eliminated. As you can see, the current range is, is pretty small. And uh, it didn't take too much time to do it because they were shot out uh, directly, their food was taken because uh, settlers were eating their food, destroying their habitat. And it didn't take long before it whittled away to what we now see today, in including uh, a considered total extirpation of the eastern hoop for populations thereof. Walter, in our discussions, we've we've talked quite a bit about the overhunting of mountain lions. Could you discuss that for a moment? Sure can. Bounties were put out on the animal. You know, top predators don't make animals go away. You know, when settlers first showed up, there were lots of pumas, they were everywhere. Lots of wolves and coyotes and the like, but there was a bounty of, of uh, animals that we would eat. But I think what happened is people are greedy and they were just shooting and shooting and killing. And then they just started to look at wolves and pumas as competitors for the food that was disappearing. That's how I sort of see it. And they started to put bounties on it. And um, a bounty can mean an awful lot of money for people that were generally poor. Yeah, um, I actually have done a little bit of research on that. And I, I found that in the mid 1800s, the Commonwealth was paying $15 for mountain lions to anyone who would kill one. And uh, I calculated that that would equal about $510 uh, in today's economy. Which can make a big difference. And furthermore, think of what $500 could do for, it's one thing with, for what $500 could do for you and for me, uh, or for somebody that makes more money than us. But think about people that are very disadvantaged and, and live in poverty, which is what a lot of people lived in in, in the United States then. $500 is an awful lot of money. We've also talked about the fact that historically there were some very infamous mountain lion hunters. And here we have an example of one who was active in Center and Clearfield counties. Uh, and also getting into Mifflin, Juniata County, places like that. This fellow was nicknamed the Lion Hunter of the Juniata. And allegedly he killed 50 panthers single-handedly in 
about a 25 year period? Well, they, they're not at all, they, they weren't at all difficult uh, to catch. Dogs could treat them very easily and uh, they could be lassoed very easily once they were up in a tree. You have to remember, these are big uh, top predators. They really don't have anything to be scared of. I think they were just sort of more confused by these sorts of things. So killing them wasn't all that difficult. Well, tell us a little bit more. Oh, and here we see a graphic showing, uh, according to one source, by the 1860s, the counties in red were the few remaining pockets of mountain lions still existing in Pennsylvania at that time during the era of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And I think when we had discussed it, uh, Brad, you were mentioning that Shoemaker, who we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit, had correspondence with people. So it's, it's so the, that the red uh, map is probably accurate for what it says was there in that area. But because we don't know who he was talking to elsewhere, we really can't be sure that the map might not have been bigger. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we agreed was sort of the, the takeaway is that absolutely by the 1860s, their range had shrunk considerably. Oh, absolutely. Because if you're at the point where you're now having to ask people like this, if they're there, then you know that there's that something really uh, precipitous has happened to that population. Mm -hmm. At some point, you know, when, when people uh, are harvesting something, uh, even this happened with the, the passenger pigeon. They seem innumerable, and then suddenly they're, they're all but gone. It just seems to tip just like that. Hmm. Very interesting. So tell us a little bit about our specimen, where it came from, where it was found, what sure. its story is. It was, part, uh, it was found around the pinnacle of the Blue Mountains in uh, Berks County, right uh, about where uh, Hawk Mountain is, which is very interesting because that was started by Rosalie Edge, who was horrified at uh, what was being done to raptors. They were being shot out too. And Hawk Mountain was a favorite place for hunters to stand and shoot birds that were going through there as a flyway. Well, that area is actually where uh, this cat was, was uh, shot. And, and it was a female, as you can see here, was killed by Thomas Anson. He was a laborer in August. The female was a young female, uh, about six foot five and a half inches, 146 pounds. That's typical. Uh, and that's that's the genesis of our of our specimen. Now, what uh, what happened thereafter was it was sold to, uh, to Bob Fultz at a um, at an estate sale for Mr. Shoemaker in 1959. He was the historian for the Game Commission and he had many mounts of many kinds of, of uh, animals. Then Bob Fultz in turn, he donated the mount to us, to the State Museum. He was not living in Pennsylvania at the time, but his twin brother Jack was. He was living in, in York. The mount was still in his house. And Jack's son Joe is the one who arranged with the State Museum and, and me uh, to get the cat. It was really quite a surprise, you know, that, Brad, that, that, you know, just out of nowhere, then you get, you're suddenly contacted by somebody. And this cat is famous in, in, it, in the biology of, uh, of cougars because it was used for DNA analysis. It was used for part of the historical record. It has an awful lot of intrinsic value from, in, 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 in many aspects of, uh, of academia and of conservation. One of the, the things that excited the two of us, we've actually found a newspaper article talking about our specimen in 1912. And in 1912, more than 100 years ago, the newspaper mentioned that the mouth was in very bad condition. Actually, it said uh, more exactly that it was not a very good taxidermy job. Uh, Walter, talk a little bit about what the condition was like when you received it in 2005 and how the State Museum addressed this condition. That, what you see in front of you is exactly what the cat looked like when you got it. It was horribly bleached out. The, uh, somebody had tried to uh, uh, fix them out 
in a in a very uh, sort of amateur kind of way. Uh, and it really needed to be conserved. Now, unlike modern day mounts, this one, the filling of it was actually uh, grass, dry grasses wrapped. The cat has many of its original bones. That's also interesting and different. And thank goodness we have it. But it was in very rough shape. Uh, the eyes were replaced, uh, the, the, the excellent eyes from the first time were replaced with marbles. The whiskers, they use grass. Uh, you know, you can see that the tail was broken. Uh, so what we got was still valuable, but in, in very bad shape and in great need of being conserved. Well, this little cat meant, a, means an awful lot to an awful lot of us. So we wanted to give it our best. And our best was through wildlife preservations in uh, Woodland Park, New Jersey, through an exquisite, uh, world-renowned taxidermist, George Dante. And uh, we got the cat over to him. And uh, he didn't go too heavy-handed to preserve the original integrity, because there was something to be said for the fact that this is an old specimen. But what he did do was a perfect balance. He did conserve it so that it's excellent shape. It's representative of what the cat looks like. But we weren't going to be giving it I guess just for lack of a better phrase, plastic surgery. We did what was proper to bringing it, to restoring it as it should be. Notice the spots on the feet that helps, uh, that indicates it's you, you know, cougars everywhere of all types uh, start off uh, speckly and then it fades as they get older. The eyes are interesting. The new eyes that were put in came from a place in New York City that used to do this for mounts, then over a couple of generations have shifted more and more to dolls. But the eyes that, that we picked were the very kind of eyes that were used for early mounts as well and should be. So it kind of came full circle in that way, which is neat. Now, that was our uh, efforts and our, uh, it was a mission to us to, to restore this animal and to take good care of it. We are the State Museum of Pennsylvania and something like this, we want to put together all the expertise we can so that this can be uh, here in perpetuity to be used and shared and studied and, and learned about. And here you can see, this is a day and dark difference, isn't it? You look up at the top one and you just forget for a minute that it's in, in rough shape. But as for the color, kind of hard to tell in a way because you're just sort of looking at, it, it, you're just looking at that mount just for what it is. But once you put it up against what a cat should look like, what a difference. And actually, if any of you who are listening to this uh, uh, presentation, please check out Mammal Hall and look at the elk. The elk was very bleached out and hard to tell over time. It's just what happened. And then when it was restored, you, then you really saw the difference. It really just is eye popping, as you can see right here with this cat. Yeah, uh, speaking from my own perspective, I was shocked uh, when it came back. Just how much richer and darker the color was. I had no idea how much it had been bleached, how much it had been bleached out. Well, you know, Brad, I was genuine, generally and genuinely proud for the whole thing. Um, it really turned out well. I, I thought that we that we really did right by this cat. We, uh, if I might just add to, we can leave this slide. If you look at the uh, base, the base too is in rough shape. And uh, uh, both George and I agreed we wanted to keep the original base. I'm sure it was a single plank. I mean, the, the wood is probably it was as old as the cat itself, if not older, in terms of when it was cut down. And all. So we really have quite a snapshot of history, an ancient tree, ancient time of a cat that, that once was part of a huge population. So what do you do next with it? Well, people study it. And there's good reasons to, very, very important reasons to for conservation, for science. But ultimately these things are a story for human beings because if human beings don't care about something, then it doesn't really have much hope or it, or it's, or it can be easily put at risk. So the goal is, is for awareness. That's really what I think all of these things are about is to develop awareness for Pennsylvanians of their rich natural uh, legacy. And so, 
what better uh, an opportunity when it arose to share this cat at the farm show. And it was a hit. It was, I worked two days at the farm show and uh, I couldn't even guess how many conversations resulted from visitors coming up and, and appreciating our, our specimen. And not, not only did I notice that, Brad, um, but people that would come up and look at it, some would engage and talk a lot to it. But one of the things I did notice in what sort of looks like just this endless movement of people going by because the farm show is a busy place. Most of the people walking by were, were it was a head turner for them, even if they didn't stop. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One of the things uh, we wanted to do today was talk a little bit about the allegation that this is the quote, last Pennsylvania mountain lion. Uh huh. And uh, so Walter is a zoologist, I'm a historian, and we kind of approach, approach this topic in a little bit different way. And as a historian, I really wanted to dig into the old records to see what we could find about this. And uh, Walter and I pieced together this timeline of ownership from when it was shot in 1874 to the present day at the State Museum. And on this timeline, there's one thing I don't like and one thing I do like. I don't like this period of unknown. We don't know where it was, what happened to it. Uh, Walter, you've joked that it was probably in some person's tavern somewhere uh behind the bar we just don't know that's a yeah it's a, a pretty long period of time several decades during which we just have no idea where it was but what we like about this timeline is that by 1912 it had come into possession of henry shoemaker henry shoemaker was sort of a renaissance man uh, was very involved. He actually was one time, uh, once the chairperson of the Pennsylvania Historical Commission, the predecessor organization to the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. He was also the involved with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. He was the official folklorist of the state of Pennsylvania, someone who published very frequently on a variety of topics. Uh, was very interested in conservation. He knew Teddy Roosevelt, he knew Gifford Pinchot, and he talked quite a bit about our specimen and linking our specimen to Thomas Anson in 1874. Yep. So if Henry Shoemaker was talking about these things in 1912, 1913, 1914, we feel pretty confident that the story, the basic facts of the story are true. However, that said, Henry Shoemaker did have a reputation for embellishing stories. So we, we consider his basic facts to be accurate, but we take some of, the, some of the tales he tells with a grain of salt. And incidentally, Henry Shoemaker was the author of one of the best sources on mountain lines in Pennsylvania, even still to this day, which he published in 1914, uh, which you can see here. Um, but doesn't, you know, when, uh, as we move on in, in, in this timeline, Fred, it's always when I look at, just look at the timeline, this period of entirely unknowing, it's a black box, anything could have happened. Then fortuitously, 1912 to 1959, it was kept you know, and protected by somebody. And then it, yeah. then it went to Bob Fultz, who, thank goodness, saw value to it and took it. It just shows you just how fragile, how it could have turned on a dime that at any given moment, this thing, this cat could have been lost. And surely so many others undoubtedly were. But this just, this one just kind of made it through the gauntlet. And, and it's, it's just stunning when, you can, yeah. when something like that can make it over that period of time, and it took it took some hard knocks. We saw the pictures of it, but we got it. Yeah, and also interesting, Bob Fultz went on to have a 
very long career as a naturalist with the National Park Service. But in 1959, he was just a college student. Uh, but even as a college student, he knew this is something very special. And I, I, I daydream in my mind about where did he, what did he do? What did this college student do when he came home back to campus with this taxidermy mountain lion? What did his classmates, what did his roommates think? Um, but thank goodness that he did that. So it's because of people like Henry Shoemaker and Bob Holtz realizing the specialness of this that, uh, that it has survived. And I'll, I'll shamelessly plug the State Museum that fortunately there, there exists such a repository for uh, protecting and keeping and, uh, and putting to use uh, such specimens. As Walter and I dug deeper into the history of the mountain lion, we actually found three really excellent historic sources that very specifically discuss our mountain lion specimen. The first was the Reading Eagle newspaper, which makes sense because that covered Berks County where the mountain lion came from. Next was Forest and Stream magazine, which evolved into what we know today as Field and Stream, uh, a national publication. And then the publication we mentioned previously, Henry Shoemaker's book. Now, what's interesting is all three of these sources agree on the basic facts. Thomas Anson, 1874, near what's today Hawk Mountain. But there is a lot of difference in the small details. For example, the 1874 store sources tell this very elaborate story of Thomas Anson being attacked by the mountain lion and the mountain lion was moments away from killing him when Anson pulled out his knife and stabbed it to death. Henry Shoemaker's story is from 1914 is much more subdued. He says that they knew this mountain lion was around. So a few hunters gathered their guns. They found it. Thomas Anson shot it. I'm not sure which story is the most accurate, but we we definitely note that some of these details differ from source to source. One thing that's interesting though, none of these sources say this was the last mountain lion in Pennsylvania. None of them say that. And in fact, so, so we dug a little deeper into records of the Commonwealth. Remember we mentioned that the Commonwealth was paying bounties on mountain lions and we wondered was there a bounty play, paid on our mountain lion when Thomas Anson shot or stabbed it in 1874? And lo and behold, that was not the case. The last bounty was paid to a man in the Meshannon Valley region, right around the border of Center and Clearfield County in 1886. So 12 years later. So, Ours was not the last mountain lion killed in Pennsylvania. We've also found dozens and dozens of newspaper accounts of mountain lion sightings well into the 1900s. Back 1913, I've seen several from 1913. That seems to be a big year for sightings. Thereafter, they really start to taper off. But even if only 20% of these are valid. There were certainly sightings after ours was taken in 1874. So the, the bottom line is, ours is not the last mountain lion shot in Pennsylvania, nor is it the last mountain lion seen in Pennsylvania, but it's the last one for which we have both documentation and a surviving specimen. Exactly. And I think, Walter, you touched on earlier why that's so important when you talked about it being like the first edition of a book and an important tool for raising awareness. An inexhaustible source 
of uh, answers for questions to be asked. Another question, which I think we hear a lot at the State Museum, and I know I heard this quite a bit when I was at the farm show with our mountain lion, are they here now? And uh, I just did some looking at newspaper reports. Everything from the York Daily Record to the New York Times talks about mountain lion sightings in Pennsylvania, in New York State, in Western Maryland. There are dozens of reports. And the one in the lower left corner, a rural legend, a search for Pennsylvania's mountain lion, that came out just a few days ago. So this is a, a really a, a topic of current interest that uh, one here is discussed often. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they, they've talked about this and they say, while confirmed cougar sightings have occurred recently uh, in the East, there is currently no scientific or physical evidence documenting the continued existence of a population of wild Eastern cougars. So that's what the Fish and Wildlife Service says. Walter, what are your thoughts on all these sightings? Are they valid? Uh, are they credible? What do you think? Well, these aren't incompatible with one another when you think about it. Uh, when it comes to sightings, there I can only come up with three categories. One of them is uh, tall tales. Another one is an honest error. It's very easy to misjudge uh, distance and size. And then there are absolutely uh, credible sightings. I think what's uh, being uh, argued by the Fish and Wildlife Service is the difference between something moving through or released as packs, and we can talk about that in a minute, versus a self-sustaining population. So it's one thing for me to be in my backyard, look up in the sky and see a pileated woodpecker fly by. That's one kind of record. It's a different thing if there's a nesting pair in my park, okay? Well, by extension, look at the whole state of Pennsylvania. There are an awful lot of people, more than you might think, that do keep large exotic animals licensed. Things get away, maybe they're released, and who wants to say anything about it? Likewise, as you showed in that other, that other slide that we have here, they make long distance tracks, these animals. And when you think of how Pennsylvania is the land of milk and honey, the deer and elk and all of these things and no cats to live there, it would seem to me that that would be quite a draw for them. So I would be surprised if they're not, these animals aren't coming through, notwithstanding releases or escapees from cats. But it just remains to be seen, are there any uh, 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 active populations? established populations that are, you know, just uh, reproducing internally here in Pennsylvania. And that we just, I, we don't know. Yeah. And incidentally, this graphic we have on the screen shows the route taken by a mountain lion that was actually hit by a car in Connecticut. But through DNA analysis, they determined it had come from South Dakota. So this one mountain lion traveled this long, long distance so it, uh, this tale, for, which is very clearly documented, shows that they have the, the potential, the capacity to move great, great distance. Right. But is there a self-sustaining, you know, population? You know, colonization, it's a two-step process. First, you have to get there, which is what the cat did. But then you have to reproduce, which to our knowledge, it did not. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing interesting we learned during our research that uh, the Pennsylvania Game Commission has issued nearly a thousand permits to Pennsylvanians who are keeping mountain lions today. So when, when you mentioned that, it's, it's not a few small pockets here. There are many mountain lions here uh, in zoos and nature preserves in 2021. And a side note, there actually was a mountain lion killed in Crawford County, Pennsylvania in 1967 that uh, was later determined to have been escaped from a circus. 
So it is this, there is documentation of this escapee idea happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Walter, if someone in our audience believes they have seen a, a mountain lion in the wild in Pennsylvania, what, what do you recommend they do? I would write down everything I saw, you know, while it's fresh in your mind. And then I would contact the Pennsylvania uh, Game Commission. They're going, they are the, the, the place to go, the logical uh, institution to go to. I'm sure they, they would want to know uh, what you found. And then they can evaluate it along with everything else. Because I think, you know, people see an awful lot of things. And it might be an innocent mistake. They may have goofed. They may have seen the real thing. Uh, but this way can be evaluated in a venue that, that's uh, fitting for it. Okay. And you can see we have a Pennsylvania Game Commission uh, email address which you can use. And we'll include that uh, in our post presentation email follow up. We'll, we'll share that address uh, in case you, you would like it and you miss it. Brad, if I could add this, uh, it's something you and I have discussed, but you know, I think it's worth sharing with our audience. You know, when, when I was at the uh, farm show uh, on shifts with the cat, uh, there were individuals that, that were, would share stories with me of sightings that they, of the cats they had. Most of these were older folks, hunters, and they weren't being, uh, they weren't bragging about it. They weren't uh, talking loud about it. They're actually kind of humble about it, that they, that they believe that this is what they had seen. And from the descriptions that they gave for many, I think they saw them. Not all, I mean, but but it just seemed to me that there was a, there's an, a lot of earnest uh, outdoors men and women uh, whose observations have have credibility, mm -hmm. and it just it it means that that there is potential for cats to be here, but the next step is to determine are they are they established. Again? And that, that to me is the million dollar question. And yeah. That's the fun of biology, actually. Hmm. Uh, and I think that's kind of where we are today. Very interesting. Well, that concludes our formal presentation, but I see we have quite a few questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing our screen, stop okay. the presentation, and we'll get to some questions here. Yeah, and remind the audience here, um, we're not going to use the chat box, we're going to use the Q&A box if you do happen to have any of those questions. And if you also look in the chat box, that's my place to share things with you. I did include that link to the commission. And then Brad, hit us up with question number one. So first question, uh, also have some really great comments that I appreciate from folks. Um, which uh, we'll definitely make note of and add to our records mm -hmm. uh, about some of the history. Um, but the first, question, the first question I see is, it was from 1912, how did it not decay? How did it not, I'm sorry? Decay? How did it not decompose? Oh, well, you know, so it, long? It, that uh, is impressive. Uh, as well, because they they clearly did a good job of tanning the hide, and then they did a good job of using very dry grass when they rolled it up. It, you know, it was done properly the first time. Of course, no matter how properly you did it, if it's sitting out in the rain, if it's in very damp conditions, etc., it's going to fall to pieces in no time. So, very fortunately, where however that cat was kept, it was kept thank goodness, in, a, in a, a climate that was dry. And I will say if it spent most of its uh, uh, mounted life in Pennsylvania, I, I think it's fair to say that, that uh, other than basements, uh, Pennsylvania homes can, can be drier than the, than, the, than the desert. I mean, there's no dewfall in the winter. And so I think it was very fortunate fortunate indeed that that cat was somehow kept, and certainly for a long stretch with Shoemaker, that it was kept in uh, 
a climate suitable for, for maintaining mounds. It, I guess it, we don't know if it was luck or if it was good thinking on the part of whomever had that cat in those intervening years that, that are a mystery to us. But such as it is, there was no sign of, of rot in any way that would be associated with uh, a, a mold and in in breakdown. Interesting. Next question, what type of wood was used for the base? I'm not sure. Uh, I think that there was thought that it was cherry, but I don't want to be, I don't want to uh, say that for certainty. I'm kind of interested in it though, that when you look at it, that was definitely one plant. And so it came from a very big tree. We can double check that and provide the answer in our follow-up email. So I'm sure yes, we have that in our because I Because I know we have the answer. I, I want to say it's cherry, but we'll get you the answer. Next, we have a comment from uh, one of our friends at the State Library uh, mentions that the Pennsylvania line or Panther book is available through the State Library as a digitized document through their online catalog. So that's, that's, that's excellent. It sure is. Uh, next question, certain animals have come back from extinction uh, or extirpation, do you think the mountain lion could come back? Could, yes. Will, I don't know. It's up to people. There's lots of big rugged open areas in Pennsylvania that, would be superb, that are superb habitat for mountain lions, but, but you have to want to. Now, wolves have been re-established to, to, to really healthy populations in states, and now states suddenly want to have uh, open seasons effectively on them. So it, it really is up to what humans want. So the answer is yes, they definitely could, but it would be a matter of policy. Yeah, and an interesting side note, Walter, Henry Shoemaker, in his 1912 book, talked about this very subject. He was talking about how to reintroduce uh, a mountain lion population in Pennsylvania. His primary interest was, as much as he was a naturalist, a conservationist, he wanted to see a sustainable population for the benefit of hunters. Mm -hmm. uh, well, see, he understood uh, ecological principles that, that the, these predators, they're, they're not competing with you. What they're doing is they're, they're, sh they're sharpening uh, through selection the healthiest of animals. There would be no chronic wasting disease. There wouldn't be all of these sorts of problems that we have today, runaway rabies and certain animals and things. Not when you have wolves and coyotes. As I say, they're, they're, they're like the lawnmowers or, or blade sharpeners, keeping things tightly adapted in, to, the, to the environment of the day. Uh, next, uh... An easy question, I can't answer this. Does Zoo America still have the mountain lions? Uh, last time I was there, which was about a year ago, yes, they still had two. Uh, next, uh, why does the Penn State logo sometimes have five toes? <laughs> a good question for Penn State, I'm going to say. Yeah, I, I agree. Department. So next question, and, and we know the answer to this one, Walter. Uh -huh. uh, has anyone managed to get genetic sequence information from the skin? Oh yeah, yes they did. And in fact, uh, uh, I shared that slide earlier in the presentation of a researcher and that was actually what she was doing. She was taking a sample Penn State has published a paper on this. It came out in about 2017. They studied a variety of known specimens of mountain lions from the east, and they were trying to determine if, by looking at the gene sequence, if it was indeed genetically unique from Western, it, its Western counterparts. So their, their paper is very interesting. Um, and we'd be happy to share that with anyone that's interested. Uh, 
Uh, in fact, we can include a link to it in our uh, uh, follow-up email. But can you see it's it's a world of possibilities with a specimen. There was no DNA sequencing back then. And down the road, long after we're gone, there will undoubtedly be new tools to answer new kinds of questions we couldn't have even imagined now. Um, I'm going to jump ahead here. A really interesting uh, note from one of our audience members on the five toes question. Uh, one of our participants says that um, his belief was that there was concern about infringing on Clemson's logo, which has the correct four toes. Um, and that's why you sometimes would see the five toe to basically avoid copyright issue. Well, then we got them beaten by a toe. <laughs> but it sounds like they've, they've since corrected that. Mm. So another question, and we were just talking about this the other day, Walter, when the Panther was remounted, was there evidence of stab or gunshot wounds that we forensically looked for? Well, uh, George found that there was a hole in the gut. And the way of it and the, the uh, color of it on the other side was suggestive of, of gunshot. And now let's pretend that it had been a knife. A knife wound there wouldn't have killed the cat or it certainly wouldn't have killed it directly. So my money is, is on... Uh, on a rifle shot that could look at. Which is consistent with Henry Shoemaker's account, which is a little, just seems a little less romanticized mm -hmm. uh, than the 1874 accounts with the wild battle for the hunter's life <laughs> that in this cabin. Well, just think of, think of the old carvings of the whales with their vicious sharp teeth and angry look on their face. And uh, as if they were savage animals attacking whalers. And then you look at these whales and it's a complete opposite. Um, next question. Uh, one of our attendees says that her great grandfather had a dairy farm near Jersey Shore, uh, which uh, I believe that's Lycoming County, and apparently had multiple cougar sightings during the 1930s. Do you think that some could have survived in the 30s or later? I believe so, yeah. A, a, a side note related to that, there was a specimen shot in Maine in 1936 that is allegedly the last mountain lion from anywhere in the east, uh, Florida panthers notwithstanding. Um, so that's... 1930s as well. Maybe, maybe a way to look at it, to visualize it for folks is imagine a flat surface like a, a table outside and it rained and, and there's water, it's thin layer of water covering like a puddle on the table. Then it starts to evaporate and that's gunshots. And then before you know it, you just have these little droplets, little pockets of populations that then just become little areas of only an individual here and there is, is, it, is, the, is the species begins to, to disappear. And that's about what it was. So her great granddad probably just had one of those little pockets remaining of a, one cougar or a couple of the, the, up in Maine. They shot the last one that was probably the lone cougar for a long time. For all we know, there may have been some that just died of natural causes unknown to anybody subsequent to that time. We just don't know. Yeah. And as we mentioned earlier, what we do know and what makes ours special, it's the last one, which has the combination of the documentation and the specimen. Right. We can prove that, that what was stated to have been killed was killed, when and where it said. Whereas other things, even if they're true, it, it just can't be verified to that extent. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, I should also point out, there are about five or six other Pennsylvania mountain lions floating around in the Commonwealth. Two of them are actually documented and older than ours. Uh, one's from the 1850s uh, at Penn State University, 
ones from the 1860s at Albright College. Uh, the other ones, to my knowledge, we just don't know much about them. Lycoming County Historical Society has one. They just don't know anything about it. They just know it's there and it's been there for a long time. Um, but ours, ours is, again, special for the, the documentation we have to accompany the specimen. Well, on one hand, I lament the fact that we don't have a better series of them. But I also understand that the, that the reason for killing them wasn't in any way for science. It was because it was, it was, it was considered a varmint. It's something to be uh, 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 eliminated. So however unfortunate it is that we don't have series of these animals, it's all the more impressive that we have the few that we do in light of the fact mm -hmm. that the goal was to eradicate it, uh, period. Yeah. So another question we have, are there other specimens at the museum that are reported to be the last of something? No, but we come close with a Carolina parakeet that was uh, uh, killed in the panhandle of Florida. We have its, uh, um, we've got, we have it, it is a mount. And we also have a um, an ivory-billed woodpecker, and it too has uh, collection data, but not not as the last ones, but but getting close to the end of the animal, unfortunately. And I think this, as I recall, the same is true with some of our passenger pigeon mounts. The same is true with those as well. And what's interesting about the passenger pigeon, at least in our collection, is we probably have, off the top of my head, we have probably between uh, 10 to 15 of them. So do you think that the museum has any confirmed PA woodland bison? No, we do not. Who's our, what's our bison from, do we know? Yeah, out west. All right, guys. Well, this was awesome as always. Um, I'm going to put that email um, and some other links in the chat box um, for um, any things that you want to send to us along the way. You just thought of something at the last minute. Please go ahead and share that with us. Walter and Brad, thank you so much for sharing this information with us today. And, um, you know, we've got lots of other great programs coming up in the very near future. Walter, actually, you're joining us again May 28th, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this time you're going to be talking about turtles. Yep. Yep. And Brad will join us again May 21st, and he is going to be talking about uh, the history of Pennsylvania women and the role as game changers. And of course, next week, we're going to be moving back to art, and we'll be joined with Amy Hammond, and we're going to talk about the conservation, another one, conservation of the Violet Oakley drawings. So once again, thank you everybody for joining us. Have a great weekend and see you later.